been exporting to the international community. So imagine if I told you that all of these diseases, from HIV to diabetes to influenza to tick-borne encephalitis, can be treated by a novel class of drugs, and that these drugs are being sold in over a dozen countries with plans of the manufacturers to invade the markets of the US and uh, Europe as well, not yet, and that articles promoting such drugs with positive results have been published in uh, all of these journals, which are international, and some of them quite good. Drug Discovery Today, Medical Virology, uh, PLOS One, uh, Antiviral Research, and so on and so on. And these drugs, they're called release active drugs. They're all made in Russia by a single company. And they're based on antibodies, which are stored in room temperature. They are taken orally, and they are diluted. They are diluted to such uh, extent that there is no antibodies left. So here's an example. This is a drug called anaphron. Um, that's how it looks uh, in Russia when it's sold. It says that it contains 0.03 grams of affinity purified antibodies to human interferon gamma. And you say, well, that's fine. But then there's a fine print in the instruction that says that these antibodies are in a concentration, we're taking a concentration of higher than 10 to the power of minus 16 nanograms per gram. So if you multiply all the numbers, you get something that you know, there's no antibodies, basically, it's just sugar. This one is against influenza, but not just influenza. So this is a Russian pharmacy, and here there is um, an advertisement that you should use it to prevent tick-borne encephalitis. And that's actually illegal because it's uh, in, uh, in recommendations. Uh, and specifically, uh, even against um, emergency tick-borne encephalitis. So bites. when the tick bites you, you take sugar pills. And that's supposed to help. Another example, this is an anti-diabetic drug made of sugar called Subeta. Uh, so it actually consists of three types of dilutions, all of which have no antibodies. Uh, it actually doesn't make any sense, but still there are three dilutions which are mixed together. So initially they were actually uh, called homeopathic. But then the authors, I believe, that's my assumption, that they thought, well, that word is kind of, you know, not trustworthy, that people won't buy it. And so they called it release active drugs. Uh, and now that's how I think they're getting into peer reviewed papers because uh, an article about homeopathy will uh, probably prompt a more, uh, trans uh, a more deep inquiry than an article about just some kind of antibodies. Uh, and so uh, we looked at those articles. Uh, we have actually had two kind of hypotheses. One is that these guys deserve not one but three Nobel Prizes, uh, well, in physics, chemistry, and uh, physiology and medicine or that maybe there's something wrong with the article. So we looked at the articles, and we found that in the article that we looked at, we could find very different kinds of uh, errors, uh, starting from lack of proper randomization blinding, incorrect statistical analysis, missing data that the authors wouldn't provide when asked for, uh, and uh, often this undisclosed conflict of interest. For example, one thing said that there are no patents, no drugs. Uh, we don't do anything. But that was a paper they used to promote a drug. Uh, and that paper actually got retracted. I'll talk about it later. So one of the journals that published this, this is uh, the weakest journal probably. It's a Russian journal called Bulletin of Experimental Biology and Medicine. It's published by Springer now. And so uh, there was a very funny instance when the CEO and director of the company that manufactures these drugs published at least 48 papers where he was co-author uh, in an issue where he was editor. So that also happens. Uh, and some of the papers about these drugs actually are, like, they sound like gibberish. Uh, the genetic code of any organism is not merely the primary sequence of nucleotides, but also the unique integral holographic spatial structure with an intrinsic set of fine supramolecular oscillatory parameters. And that's kind of like the, how they uh, justify why this works, despite we know it shouldn't. Uh, and so on, there are many examples of that. Uh, and this reminds me of the famous uh, Alan Sokal Hawks, but uh, Alan Sokal published gibberish on purpose to kind of uh, stimulate improvement of peer review quality in journals, and this is just used to promote certain drugs. Uh, so we have uh, written to different journals, actually to all the journals except for experimental biology and medicine because that was fruitless, uh, and asked them why like, would they investigate it and would they do something about it, and sometimes we pointed out the specific flaws. We got three retractions, two from antiviral research, one from PLOS One. Uh, we got two promises of notices of concern. So the, the integrity officer of Kindalia said that they're going to be published soon. 
Uh, we got one journal that decided to go on the route to comment, uh, to publish a comment with criticism of the article. Uh, and we are hoping that other journals will follow in some way or, or, or another similar to, the, to, the, to these positive cases. Uh, but to our surprise, the journal with the highest impact factor responded not how he expected it would be. So Drug Discovery Today published a review about insulin receptors. So it's a fine review, but it also promotes the anti-diabetic drug Subeta, uh, which is sugar, as I said. Uh, and so they said that this is basically fine. It is fine because the review cites peer-reviewed papers. So first, get all of those papers retracted, and then you'll talk again. So we don't think it's fine, so we've written to PMG Evidence-Based Medicine, and our paper was called Drug Discovery Today, No Molecules Required. So because that's probably the new trend of drug discovery. Uh, so what's going on in Russia uh, right now with these drugs? So our commission has labeled them as pseudoscience in 2017, uh, along with other homeopathy. And uh, the Ministry of Health promised that they were going to investigate our findings, uh, but they didn't. They didn't make the promised commission. Instead, uh, to our surprise, the Ministry of Science uh, awarded the company that manufactures these drugs an anti-prize for the most damaging pseudoscientific project, because actually those drugs are sold uh, for tens of millions of people buy those drugs for numerous conditions, as I've showed, and uh, it's a really big health issue for Russia. Uh, and so following that, uh, Minister of Science, uh, Antichrist, the newspaper called Trotsky Varenka published criticism of those drugs. They got sued uh, in the newspaper and three authors of that paper, including one of my co-authors on the BMJ evidence-based medicine paper. The court ended recently with a peace treaty, but we still feel kind of threatened for criticizing these guys, but we're still going to continue criticizing, criticizing them nevertheless. And so the reason I came to this conference is first, as a Russian scientist, I feel that it is kind of an obligation to inform the international scientific community of the experts of bad science from Russia, uh, especially when they are in such extent. And also, we are actually not sure what we can do about this, and perhaps some advice from, from, from you would be helpful in how we can do something about uh, this proliferation of bad science and its expansion. And the third thing that I think is important is that, well, all of these cases, for me, are obvious cases of false positive results being published, but they were all peer-reviewed, and so the reviewers somehow mislooked uh, many different kinds of mistakes which were done in these papers, well, aside from the fact that there is actually no active substance in the drug. So perhaps if you look at the reasons why the reviewers have published, uh, have accepted these papers, have, um, have, have let them get published in the journals, uh, that would tell us something about why other false positive results with normal drugs can be published in different medical, biomedical journals. So this story somehow reminds me of a very interesting paper I've read by uh, Eric Vagelmakers and others. It was a case in social uh, psychology, so there was this journal of personality and social psychology that published an article that people can see the future uh, with paranormal ability with POS and 0 0.05, of course. Uh, and so Eric Wagenmakers argued that, well, there are two options. Well, either the author deserves, uh, I don't know, a, a big prize or probably uh, something went wrong during the peer review process, and that example could lead to some re-evaluation of how the peer review is handled in uh, this field of science. And so I think that the case of release active, active drugs could be useful to re-evaluate how peer review could be improved uh, in biomedical literature. And on that, I would like to thank everybody who participated in the retractions and in uh, communicating to the public about these cases and to my co-authors. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Right, hope questions. Who'd like to go first? My sympathy is we know about this slide. Um, and we've often wondered in our investigations in Japan what happened in the peer review process. And it seems to me if one has a sufficient body of evidence for one publisher in terms of a series of journals, it would be really nice if the publisher would go back and work and look at across the board what was happening in the peer review process. But I don't know if they would just say it was up to the uh, the journal editors to look at that, but um, 
you know, once or twice we've said, would it be possible to see what the peer review had said, how these papers ever got published, but we haven't got anywhere at all. I can only uh, comment with some anecdotal uh, cases. So in one case of a paper, uh, the, the editors actually sent our criticism to the reviewer, who was initial reviewer of the paper, and the reviewer, well, basically he said, oops. Uh, and so, the, obviously, it was just, uh, he didn't realize what he was really reviewing. Uh, so that happens, uh, at least it's a possibility. Uh, and also, uh, what, 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 what can uh, go wrong is, well, there are actually some papers published on the quality of peer review, what kind of errors do reviewers often kind of uh, miss. Uh, I am not sure of the exact figures or something, but uh, it's quite often that they can miss uh, even severe flaws in research methodology. So uh, perhaps actually when we're talking about um, papers which deal with medicine, maybe additional instructions for reviewers to make sure that the st study is properly you know, blinded, randomized, or whatever. Just to reply, I mean, we're working on a, a checklist that actually we've been talking to one of the publishers could be used uh, just to highlight things people should look for if they're trying to answer questions for research and technology. Thank you. We'll come over here and then, and then have the yeah, then Oh, yeah. Right. Well, we can blame the peer reviewers, but the <laughs> truth is, is that uh, you illustrated that there were really work to obfuscate this information uh, that says that there's nothing in there and to uh, not include information about conflict of interest. So reviewers still have to review what they're presented with, okay? And so unless there's some way to, to check that, uh, you know, reviewers uh, can't be blamed for missing something that's not there. Well, I'm not trying to put all the blame on, on reviewers, of course. Uh, well. I think that uh, if you don't know what the substance is, that is a, I think you probably, if I was a reviewer, I think I would inquire. Um, not sure about every, well, I, I think that's, that's an issue. But uh, as I've said, some of, the, some of the articles, they actually contain deep flaws, not just concealed conflicts of interest, which of course should have been declared. And that's not the reviewer's fault, of course. Thank you, we'll come here. And then, um, like Lex, you know, no comments, only questions. I was just going to reply because you were asking about journals and I work for Elsevier and we publish antiviral research and we also publish drug discovery today. So I knew about the retractions because I check, I look at all the retractions before they, and indeed my first question was, you know, how did this, how did you not notice that it was homeopathic? So we did look into it, of course, and indeed the response I got from the editors and looking at the reviews was that they had, as you said, um, they had hidden it pretty well. You know, and it's not for me to judge, it's not my subject area, but um, I didn't know about honestly drug discovery today, so we'll certainly speak to them about it. I wasn't aware of the case. Um, and that is also, I think, probably more often can happen with, with big publishers, that editors are independent and they will handle things differently. And um, we try to have consistent best practice, but they are independent, and now that we're aware, I'm very happy to speak to them about it. Let's hear your question before, let's hear the next question before you may respond to both at the same time. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I just want to congratulate you. I think your research is very, very important, especially in light of the fact that we still do have health systems, like, sadly to say, Luxembourg, but also Switzerland, who do pay for these things through public insurance. So I think your work should really continue. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to comment on about the drug discovery. So it's a, it's a, it's a special case yeah. because it's a review. And the, most of the review is actually a good review about insulin receptors, and it appears that they have inserted actual specialists in insulin receptors who actually wrote the, most of the review. And then there is this part about this Zubeta drug, which incorporates uh, links to other articles which I have mentioned somewhere in, in, my, in my talk. Uh, and so we ask, like, can we publish criticism? Can, we, can you put a notice of concern? Could you edit the article? Or something like that. Uh, and, so, uh, and they also inserted, of course, uh, Oleg Epstein, who is the CEO of the company, as co-author of that paper. But there's actually just a little, uh, a little paragraph about it. But it's still, I think, it's an issue. Thank you very much. Thank you.